this time, we're going to change the order of service and turn it over to Sister Rose. Let's give her a hearty amen as she comes. I'm going to be preaching a little while to you tonight, more or less talking to you in reference to the legacy of our life. I was thinking about that the other night, and I thought to myself, everybody should have a legacy, everybody. Some people leave a bad legacy. They, their life, you would always go to them and say, you don't want to be like so-and-so. You know, he lived his life like this one, and that one lived like that, and all this, and, and you think, I don't want to live like that. I don't want to leave that kind of testimony. As I began to reflect over my own life this week, I thought to myself how thankful I was and, and is today for how I lived. I'm glad that I don't come to the end of my life with the feeling of, I wish I could change yesterday. I can't change it, neither do I want to. But I think every person can pretty much can pretty much live their life that you don't, when you get to the end, you're not thinking about what you, what you, what you did wrong. And I just decided, the more I looked into it, the more I thought, I need to talk about this. As you know, I don't know when my time is. I don't think it's much longer, but uh, whatever that is, it's less time ahead of me than, than, than what's behind. But I begin to look at all the people in the Word that left something. We got great testimonies, great warriors, great people who love God and all the good things that happen to people in their life. And you know what? Your legacy, you have to live it. You just can't get that. What, however you live your life is how, what you're going to leave on record. But most of all, what you're going to leave so that when you stand before God, you're ready to meet God and not be ready. I thought about Enoch. And the scripture says that Enoch lived 60 and 5 years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. Thank God we're not to live that long anymore. And all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And Methuselah lived 180 and seven years and begat Lamech. But I think the thing that stood out to me before, after all these other people was that Enoch had this testimony that he pleased God. And I think every person at some point in time in your life, you got to deal with the fact, how did you live your life? And did you live it so that you leave something behind from people to draw from? I think sometimes people are looking at people's legacy, well, they left me some money, they left me this. No, I'm talking spiritual legacy. That is more important to your children, to the people who cross paths with you, how you lived your life, the difference that you made that you made a difference in the world because you've been here. Somebody says because she or he was here, they made a difference in the world. People's lives were changed. You know, true legacies is very hard for you to put into a category uh, of, of one, two, three, and four because it becomes so overwhelming, you can't keep up with it. So I was thanking God because when I, when I begin to study about, about Enoch, it says, and I like I like this what I part of the study I was doing. It says, when it comes to life, there is no real success without succession. Everybody's got to have somebody to succeed them. Yes. What matters most in life is that we pass on to the next generation. What matters most is a legacy of faith in Christ and obedience to Scripture, love for the local church, concern for the lost. And the least is what we urgently need to hand down to our children and our children's children. The Bible says in Proverbs, the righteous man walks in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. While the Bible encourages us to leave a financial legacy to our children, more importantly, it encourages us to leave a spiritual legacy of faith in Christ 
and the riches of his grace. And I began to think back on my grandmother and how, what her legacy was, and she was a woman of great faith. I never saw her um, in fear or not trusting God, no matter how the impossibilities were, no matter how whether her children was facing death. She was strong. I've heard so many testimonies about her faith and how she trusted God and how God proved itself to her. And I thought, if you had to look at your life tonight, would God just remove, give you a, a rapture you out the world because you live such a beautiful life until, instead of you being buried, instead of you having a funeral, God just trans, transformed him and took him out of here. And I thought, what kind of life is that? That you can live a life that's so dedicated to God until um, he just wrapped you out of here. See, it tells us that the birth of Enoch's faith in God was triggered by the birth of his son, Methuselah. It said it had been well said that God uses both the grave and the cradle to awaken people spiritually. Enoch would not be the last father to sense the nearness and reality of God upon entering fatherhood. Every walk begins with a step, and when Enoch stepped into the role of a parent, it was transformative in that he gave his life to the God who gives life. He said, I think I'm right in saying that the, that the ripple effect of this man's faith uh, walk lasted more than 300 years. Consequently, we read that his great-grandson Noah also walked with God and became a preacher like his great-grandfather. You think back on when God was going to destroy the whole earth. The only thing that kept him from doing it was because Noah. He found a man who was righteous because the earth was so corrupt and so messed up. But God found a man named Noah and his legacy lives on with us today. We remember Noah and the flood coming and what have you and how God told him to build this ark and all of these things. And his life is a great testimony. You know what? You can wake up one day and just be dead sad about your life. It never amounted to very much. I never did nothing for anybody. I, and people's lives wasn't better because of me. Or some message that I preached that people never forgot. Because it stayed with them. I remember meet, meeting people after we got back from Germany at the mall when I used to go to the mall a long time ago. And this man walked up and said, Sister Rose. And I turned around and he said, Hi, how are you? And I thought, Who are you? He said, I was in Germany. He said, I came to your services and I heard you preach. He told me the message I preach. That many years ago. He said, I never forgot that message. What is it that we're doing in our life that has such an impact on people, children, uh, adults, whoever? What kind of impact did your faith and your life of, of righteousness and holiness impact somebody's life? That somebody after you're long gone is going to draw from what you put out. They remember the time when this was said. They remember the time when Sister Rose faced this or faced that. They remember this. And how did she deal with it? This is how she dealt with it. Not that I fell down and couldn't get up. Who, who needs, you ain't, you ain't got no good legacy if all you can do is fall down. It takes a real man or woman to stand up in the midst of a crisis and say, you know what? I can do it. I don't care how impossible it looks. I can do it. And it was a man that had such faith that nothing stunned him. Nothing. You got to look at your life today and say, Sister Rose used to talk about we need faith. We need relationship with God. We need relationship with God. But they don't take the time to build it. And then the minute things go wrong, they start whining about it. Nothing is worse than a whiner. They whine about things that they could have fixed had they wanted to. They didn't want to fix it. I get tired of sometimes of constantly uh, going over the same thing with people. And, and, they, and they talk a bunch of crap. And I thought today, this morning I got up, I was vexed 
in my spirit over some things. And I call these people, I'm going to leave them nameless tonight. I shouldn't, but I will. I don't trust you. For me to trust you is huge. Because after you see so many people and so much stuff, you still not believe in people. Because everybody can talk. Very few people can give you something that's tangible, that you can really say, I can trust this person. There are not many people in the world. And I was very vexed this morning. I, I thought about it all day. I met with my family this afternoon to share with them some of the things that had happened. I was feel a great sense of disappointment. You know what? It feels good to trust, except you can't. Uh, my husband used to say, honey, I don't trust nobody. I said, well, you got to be a miserable person. You don't trust anybody? He said, I don't trust nobody. He said, I, I take people as they come. He said, I don't have no friends. I have a few associates. I said to him one time, honey, why don't you uh, invite some of the military guys uh, home for a cooked meal? He said, Rose, them Negroes not coming in my house. I don't care if they never get a home cooked meal. They ain't coming here to get one. He said, I wouldn't be bothered with them five minutes. But I, we often talked about that. Why is it that you don't trust? Because people prove they can't be trusted. They got a lot of talk. They say a lot of stuff. But trust is something you earn. You just don't do it by telling somebody, well, I trust you. No, you earn trust by the life that you live. If you don't live that life, you, don't, you better not believe. When people haven't shown you proof, don't believe it. Because no matter how they look, what they say, man is full of talk. He can do a lot of that. But when it comes to action, you don't see it. Action determines whether you are a good person or a bad person by the way you live your life, how you treat your fellow man, how whether or not you're, gonna, you're going to uh, leave something with somebody and say, you know what, if you have Sister Rose for a friend, you got a real friend, a real friend. Because I don't just talk about it. That that I say that I am, I am. Uh, I'm, I'm that person in the church, I'm that person at home. I'm that person no matter where you find me, you will not find me shifty. Nothing is worse than a moody person wants you to trust them and their mood changes more than the weather. No, can't trust you. Because what I think, who I, I, what I, who I, think I know today in actuality, I really don't know them. See? So I think, and you know what? We're living in a time that is getting worse. It's getting worse. You. Back in the day when we were coming along, people would, would close deals off of a handshake. Oh, it don't do you to close a deal signing on the paper. It don't mean jack, because I may pay you and I may not. But it, the real people, is what God's looking for in this hour, where are the real people? The people who love God, the people who live what they talk about, the people who who not just testify a testimony, but my testimony is my life. It makes a difference. See, when, when there are all kind of people, great patriarchs in scripture, who left legacies that we talk about to this day. The Apostle Paul was one of them. I mean, he went through a lot. He died a terrible death. But you knew who he was. I hate just somebody put themselves in a category with, with the Apostle Paul, Pete, Brother Peter. Who are you? You can't even begin to step in those people's shoes. You can't even begin to step in them. Listen, a godly le legacy is going to be more than anything else that you'll ever do in your life. And I thought, I don't know how many years ago the Lord spoke this to me. Uh, I couldn't even wrap my mind around it at the time. And he said, I'll make you a legend in your own day. I thought, a legend? Be a legend? I couldn't even, I couldn't grasp that. Keep on living. 
then this is what I hear. I've never seen anybody like you. I've never known nobody to do that. I've never known this. I've never known that. The legacy and the legend is in progress over all these years that to me was just a normal way to live. Just a normal thing to do. Love people, reach out, do what you can to help people. I've been that way as long as I can remember. But then after I got saved, it, it intensified and became even more. And you know what? And I'm glad. I'm glad that I have so many testimonies, I would never be able to put them in a book. I have so many people who have crossed my path. So many people. Some of them loved me completely, and some of them hated me completely. But the only thing that matters to me is how I dealt with it. How I dealt with it. At the end of the day, when they hated you, how did you deal with it? You still can love people. You still can. You got to have a forgiving spirit. You can have a forgiving spirit without and not have a pure heart. When Moses ascended to Mount Sinai uh, to talk with God, Young Joshua was right by his side. The people that walk the closest to you is the people that know you. The people, the same way with Jesus, the people that walk at a distance from him, they don't know him. They talk about him, but they don't know him. But when you get close enough and interact with him and have this relationship, that's how you get to know God. That's how you're able to trust. And I understand why some people don't trust God for healing, don't trust him for this. Well, you don't trust strangers. These people come out talking so big of when they get uh, pancreatic cancer, uh, uh, what you call them, uh, on, the, on Jeopardy. He came out and said, I'm, he said, come out, he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beat this. I thought, why do you think you're going to beat it? People dying every day from cancer, and nobody hardly ever survives pancreatic cancer. Nobody. It is the most deadless cancer you could get. But he said, he I have the utmost confidence in my doctor. I thought, you better have utmost confidence in God. That's the sure thing. Right. Everybody else may can promise you something, but they can't always deliver it. <laughs> Joshua, the reason why he was able to lead after Moses was gone, because he had firsthand uh, knowledge and watch God at work with Moses. He realized that Moses, the scripture said, was the most meekest man that ever lived. And so when it was time to lead Israel from the Jordan to, to claim the promised land, Joshua listened to God and obeyed what God told him to do. But he had been observing Moses. You know what? It is vitally important for you to have a leader and I don't mind people watching me under a microscope because I have nothing here, not one thing. Some people, brother, really, you never should. Don't find me, don't come to my house. Go, honey, what you might find, <laughs> anything but Sister Rose. Nobody can say it. Nobody can say it. I am even killed all the way across with everything. I'm not this up and down crap and all this. I was a little edgy here the, uh, last week or so ago because I, I don't like, I don't like be, not being able to function to my fullest ability. And I was somewhat handicapped, and it, it really, really kind of got to me. But I realized, okay, this is all a part of it. One thing I said to the Lord the other day, I said, um, I want to not complain about anything to the day I die. Through life, we complain without even recognizing we're complaining. I uh, don't know why this is that way. don't know why that's that way. And instead of just, and I was saying to the Lord, I want you to let me live my final days without one complaint. And the Lord said to me, if you think before you speak, then you won't complain. But most of the time, it just comes out. My head's killing me. You know, I got so and so, this is wrong. And, you know, I feel bad if you just think for a minute. When you get through talking about my head killing me, it still hurts. Right. So what, what profit is it to, to complain about it? Just go ahead and do the best you can. Your head's going to hurt it some, sometimes in this world. So, but I, 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 um, I deliberately put that in me to think first. 
Because sometimes if we took the time to just think about all the good that God has done, you won't have time to complain. But the devil makes sure you don't see all that. See? So understand, do you remember how Elijah followed Elijah? Because I'm going to be just like you. He didn't, he didn't accept the thing that Elijah said, uh, if you see me go. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to see you go. Then, then he says, uh, you ask a hard thing. You, you, want to, you want to wear my mantle? You understand what that mantle consists of? So you want, you want to wear that? They don't know what all is involved. Look at people. I'm looking at the people that is grasping truth and taking hold of it, and I'm looking at others who just kind of letting it uh, graze by. No, you better pay attention. Uh, Monty has made it a, uh, a habit of everything I said, don't forget this. Don't forget that. Watch this person. Watch that person. If they wasn't with me, they won't be with you. If they didn't support me, if they didn't love me, they won't support and love you. If you didn't, if you didn't love the person, the founder of this whole thing that God put in place, you sure won't love what's coming after me. No. This is what it says. This is excellent. It says, the study of leadership Legacy, there's a difference in legacy leadership is a process of intentional influence that takes place in the context of a, context of a relationship. Over the last several weeks, we have been uh, unpacking that definition by examining the life and leadership of the Apostle Paul. As we have seen, legacy leadership is transformational. Indeed, the measure of a legacy leader's effectiveness is changing lives, both now and for generations to come. So what these kids learn in this church, they will pass that on to their kids. And they'll pass that on to their kids. And it just keeps traveling and traveling. That's why you better leave something good. Because what is it that, well, you know, my grandmother cursed out everybody when she got mad. So I curse out everybody? No, the things that we leave with our children, with the members of a church, with the people that they said they were friends in, in your life or whatever, uh, what is on the table that if they tried to break it, they'd have a hard time dealing with it? Because that's not acceptable. If God didn't accept it in Sister Rose's time, he ain't going to accept it in yours. He's not going to do it. Transformational leaders have to be transformed to be able to help other people to be transformed. But you can be. This transformation is not a one-time, once and for all event, rather it is an ongoing process that takes place across a lifetime, your entire lifetime. Paul is the example for their process, for this process. Without changing his fundamental personality, Jesus transformed Paul's character, redirected his life. Paul was transformed by his personal encounter with the risen Christ, and for the rest of his life he was being transformed into the image of Christ. It's gonna take you a complete lifetime to become exactly and become perfected the way God wants you to do it. And have a pure heart. I was thinking some people this week, I thought, boy, you got a bad heart. Because what comes out of a bad heart is bad things. So if the heart is right, you don't have to worry about it. Because everything that comes out of that is going to be right. You don't have to sit there and try to look at it and diagnose it or nothing. It is what it is. And you either what you say you are or you're not. You either for real or you're not. You either love God or you don't. You either stop sinning or you continue to sin. It's a shame. I, it's a shame that kids look at their parents and, and say, I don't want to be like my dad. I don't want to be like my mother. How horrible is that? I had a conversation with one of the teenagers in the church, and she said, I don't want to be like my mother. Is that hard to understand? If you see how weak her mother was, no, it's not. I need a strong woman. One thing that um, I listen to it occasionally, I don't listen to Wanda's tributes very often now, but when she said, Mama, you are the strongest woman that I have ever met in my entire life. That's something to leave my daughter. That's for her. She can understand you don't have to be weak. Stand up, Wanda. Fight for yourself. Do what you got to do. 
the people that affect our lives in a positive way should mark us for a lifetime. I'm going to follow that. Some things I never share with this church. Because if I did, you couldn't deal with what you hear. People sitting all over, the, all over this building, grinning. You're, the only real, you're one of the real things sitting in the church. You drive me crazy keep on talking about me, but hey, I go and put up with that. But you're who you are. That is the best thing that you could get from her. They are who they are. He's not standing up here saying a bunch of talk and don't mean, you mean every word you say. And I mean that. And, and it goes, when you say it, it goes to the heart. You think, I mean, this man is for real. He loves himself some Sister Rose. And I mean, if everybody in the church ought to know that. It's like, you know, that boy, he's really crazy about her. Because no matter what, what he's testifying about, he's going to go right back over here. It's pastor. It's not closing out without this pastor. I heard it over and over again. But it's always real. Ain't nothing worse than a liar. I despise liars. And when I hear a person just speak from their heart the truth, you can trust them. I was going to call you anyway because I know you were sick yesterday, but you could have made that journey down to k when you made it here last night. I said, I'm going to call Dennis. He disappointed me on that one. But you don't disappoint me often because you can depend on you. I thought, I know you were sick. I know you feel bad. Other people felt bad, but not bad enough not to go. Jesus felt bad when he fell down up under that cross, but he went. How many times I felt bad, but I went. I didn't even know if I, if I would survive preaching this morning. Uh, you listen to me from the pulpit, you never know I was sick one bit. Right. Not one bit. See? <laughs> when somebody has a great legacy, they will mark you for the rest of your life if you listen to them. Yes. And Paul became an imitator of Jesus. I mean, he was willing to give up everything. He said, no matter what it is, I'm ready to die for this gospel. Until you're ready to die for the cause, you don't really believe in it. If you're really ready to give your life, if you can't give your life, you're a bunch of talk. So all the things that the apostles went through, all the prophets that died violent deaths for, for the sake of the gospel, your people would never make it. Because you scream and holler all the way to the, to the last breath how bad this is. Instead of looking and saying, I'm dying for a good cause. Right. I told you a story about the man at home. Um, one of the missionaries came and told us about this missionary. He was in a, a foreign land. And they wanted to kill him. And they did kill him. And they said to him, some of the other missionaries said to him, when they're getting ready to put him before a firing squad, said, and then he was going to set him on fire. And he said, if, it's, if it was worth it, could you raise your hand up? Just raise your hand. Was it worth it? And they say, as they stood around and watched their fellow uh, missionary brother, he remembered what they said. As the fire began to burn, they said out of that flame came this man's hand and the skin was literally falling off the fingers, but he raised that hand up, it was worth it. There's not a lot of people feel that way. While you're in the midst of dying for the cause, it was worth it. Whatever I have gone through, whatever test I've had, Whatever trials, tribulations, pain, sorrow, was it worth it? Yes, it was worth it. Would I do it over again? Yes, I still would serve God. I still would live for him. Even though it has been, a lot of bad things have happened, but so many good things have happened. And so many things that I experienced that a lot of people will never experience their entire lifetime. I don't, trade, I don't take that lightly because God didn't owe me nothing. Everything he gave me, I'm grateful that he gave it to me. 
You got to look at your life and say, who do you want to be like? Who you want to model your life after? Is there somebody that you watched and over the years? You say, I'd like to be like that. I'd like to be different. It's a cost to be different. Anybody can be like everybody else. But to be different, to stand out in the crowd, you're not like everybody else. It makes a difference in our society. The thing that stands out above everything. To without saying a word, somebody recognizes something is different about you. What is that? When they don't even know who God is, what is that? What makes you so different? How do you bounce back again and again and again in spite of what you faced in your life and you didn't let the difficult times pull you down and take away your strength and your courage and your faith in God to believe that it was all worth it and I'm going to keep fighting? I never feel like there could ever be a time in my life that I wouldn't be ready to fight. That's right. I got to fight. It's worth the fight. Oh, yeah. To fight the enemy, to put him down when he thinks he's going to win, when he thinks he's overcoming. No. He's not. I'm not going to allow it. See, understand, for you to become effective, you have to go through the fire. If you don't go through the fire, you'll never be able to affect anybody's life. We must die that you might live. Until a pastor experiences death, you'll never have life. How do you get life? How do you feel like shouting? How do you feel like praising God? How do you feel like getting in there? The pastor died. Until she dies, until he dies, they'll never be effective with you. But the word says, we died that you might live. I went through, as the, as, the, as the poem I read not long ago, my purpose was you. I suffered a lot of things so you wouldn't have to suffer. I went through a lot of things that became a trailblazer for you. So when you would begin to walk this road, it don't seem as difficult. Why? Because somebody walked it before you. Somebody showed you it could be done. Yes. That's vitally, vitally important. So when I look at that, I'm thinking, okay, do you want to be remembered? Oh, you never met a weaker person than that. Always depressed, always down. Yeah, he was a, a fairly decent preacher, but he could bore you to crap. That's all I could do to sit there and put up with him. I wouldn't want nobody to say, who's preaching tonight? Sister Rose, oh no, please, not her again. You're never going to say that about me, not ever. How we must live our life, not some days right, but every day right, every day is right. Um, when do, if I have something to give you from God, I've got to get it first from God, and I've got to pay the price to get it. It's not for free. Get on your face before God. Wake up in the middle of the night. People that, I wouldn't give a nickel for a preacher who sleeps all night long. I wouldn't give a nickel for him. No. Because let me tell you, a lot of messages, a lot of things that God's going to send your way is going to be in the midnight hour. Because I want you to wake up and listen to me. Could he tell us at 10 in the morning? Yeah. But every person, I'm just trying to get you to sleep. I hate to hear somebody whining about sleep. I just need some sleep. Go ahead on, baby, and live a bit. And if you're about to miss a few hours, you won't die. You won't die. One, I love my daughter to death, but nobody better not wake her up unless it's me. <laughs> nobody. <laughs> And Nisi and Lisa them used to want to aggravate Wanda by saying, what time is it? <laughs> Call Wanda. Because <laughs> when she answers the phone, she says, hello? Because <laughs> she done looked at your number. Are you crazy? Wanda said, hello. And they would laugh and laugh. And she like, but if I called and said, Wanda, mama, yeah, 
I never get that. Hello, what is it? I told him, if you need some counseling, wait till daybreak. <laughs> if you got an emergency, it can wait. <laughs> and they used to laugh about it all the time because you could tell when you, when you don't wake her up. But I could wake her up in the middle of the night, and I did many times, 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning. The Lord done showed me something, told me something. And, and I, I'd wake up, and I, I think I got to share this with Wanda. And I called Wanda. I said, Wanda, you ain't going to guess what the Lord just said. He said, Mama, hold on a minute. Ain't even sleep. I'm going put to the, put the light out in here and go in the living room so we can talk. It wasn't. My husband's trying to get some rest. Amos wasn't going to wake up to hear nothing anyway. She was going to wake up to hear it. Just, just went on and got some sleep. Uh, you heard the telephone ring. Yeah, I know you <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have nothing to call you for. <laughs> but, I, but, but she was always that person that's going to listen no matter how, how late it is. And a lot of things happen late. That's why preachers that sleep late they don't get nothing from God. See? A legacy leaves behind your life story. How you lived your life every day. And some people will gladly forget you. You know, I'm glad they go, ooh. I hope I never see another person like them. You know, that's horrible. And people have said that. I'm just so, I was so glad the day he died or she died. Because they were such miserable people. And every time they came around, they made your life miserable. No, when they came around, they made me feel like living. They brought life to me. Legacies are important pathways or the future to follow or be guided by in order to make better decisions in life. So what do I want? A lasting legacy is all about the actions you take during your life and the way those actions affect how people remember you. Do you remember Sister Rose? Oh, yes. There's people's books I've read that's, that's been gone for years and years, and I could tell you about their story because they had an impact. They come to know God, they were for real. They wasn't people that made it today and then they're down tomorrow. How many children look at their parents and think, boy, don't go in there right now, he's in a mood. You know how horrible that is? Uh, you, don't wanna, you don't wanna do that. Because if he's in a mood, he don't wanna hear nothing. Can't talk to him. Uh, you never know where he's gonna be. Let me tell you something. Leave something for your children. Leave something for them that they can look at your life and say, you know, I want to be like my mom, I want to be like my dad. See? There's a lot of famous people who had great legacies, but I wouldn't give a nickel for them. You know why? Because they wasn't godly legacy. That's right. That's right. Nelson Mandela was a, a great, great man. But what his relationship with God, I, I do not know. But if that's all he had, he didn't have nothing. Because, I mean, you spent most of your life in prison, and you went through all this crap. But if you had God and you had done it for a good cause, that's good. So there's a lot of people that we could go back and look at their lives and say, that person really left something behind. You know, when I think about them, when I think about the words they said, when I think about the times they spoke a word of encouragement to me, I never forgot that. When I was at my lowest point in my life, they said a word to me, I never forgot it. And you know what? And I never returned back there. It lasted. It was very important, very important. So, yeah, surely you can leave a legacy. Is it good or is it bad? And then who's it going, who's it going to help? Uh, I think that was great for Mandela. I think that was great. I think Martin Luther King Jr. had a great legacy. But his life is questionable about his spirituality. 
I don't know anything about it, what things that's been wrote. I think Abernathy, his friend, wrote a book on him and talked about he was a great womanizer. Well, if he was a womanizer, he didn't get to the kingdom. Some people uh, blow your brains out with that very statement. Did you hear that? Martin Luther King Jr., the man who cared about people. He really did. He really did. He had a great dream. But if he didn't have a relationship with God, Paul said, though I give my body to be burned and everything that I have, and he said, if I don't have the love of God, it don't profit me nothing. I'd rather have a godly thing. See? Though not, not, not everyone is going to leave such an impression on the world, but we can all strive to leave, have some effect. We live one life. We're not promised ever again, and we'll never get it again in this life. What did you do with it? Make it count. Make it count that children will grow up. I think about the kids in this church. I want them to grow up and say, boy, I love Miss Rose. I got a card from Jermaine today, how sweet. He's t telling me how much he, he loves me and how much he appreciates that I give him some money. <laughs> because otherwise, he's too young to hold down a job right now. So just to have, not have some nice spending money without having to go to my mom or my dad and say, could you let me have a quarter? <laughs> I don't have to do that. <laughs> yeah. But I'm telling you, when I read his card today, I was, I was overwhelmed. I read Nate's card. You write the most beautiful card. I meant to brought it to church tonight and, and read it. I'm talking about Nate, you. He's looking around, he's looking around like, who's she talking about? <laughs> Of course, you brought me a bag of uh, uh, a box of candy that's this big. I uh, sitting on my table at home. So many people been by that box, <laughs> and they'll continue to go by there. But I thought the sweetest—you never say a lot, but in that card when you said, "Sister Rose, I come to know God because of your teaching." I was headed back to Hawaii, but I came to this church and. I learned about God. See, that's everything to me. That's everything. You don't say nothing. You just sit back and every once in a while have a little testimony that I, that I can't hear nothing you're saying. But every once in a while you have a testimony. But that card says, here's where I met Sister Rose. Thank you. You can touch somebody's life, and it touches your life. That's how we get strength. I, I reach out to you to help you. You reach back out to help me. Hey, we help each other. We're both giving something back. If somebody asked you to describe your legacy, what would it be? I like to call some people's names just for the heck of it. Well, since Rose Mines would be, I slept doing service. That's not, he was the preacher that was known to sleep. Say, that ain't right. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, it was the other preacher that Sister Rose had to constantly call out and say, wake up. Wake up, Sarah. <laughs> I would not want to be known for that. And you know what somebody's going to think? That's why she couldn't stay up on, stay together. She's always sleeping. You don't hear the word. You don't hear the word. You can't stay strong. And the devil wants you to miss the word because that's going to be something that's going to actually direct your life in the next weeks to come. So put him to sleep. Let him count the ceiling tiles. Do anything. I guess if I would ask the question, what, what is the most important role that you played in your life that left an impact, be it your teacher, be it a friend, be it my sister or my brother. What did I say? That made me feel good. I, Braylon called me the other day and, how are you doing, Miss Rose? He sounds so alive instead of dead. You sound like you came alive. He said, how are you doing, Miss Rose? He says, Braylon, I'm doing fine, Braylon, how are you? I'm fine, are you feeling better? 
talks so well. And he said, well, how, how you feeling, Miss Rose? You, you still sick? No. He really took the time to speak. And I was so proud of him. I was so proud of you, Braylon. And we had a real conversation. And what he said was from his heart. And I said, Braylon, did somebody give you your money? He said, yes, I got it. I wanted to say thank you, Miss Rose, so much for what you've done, for the kindness you've shown us. Those little things like that, that's bigger than anything in the world. Because a child recognizes that some, you did something good for me. That boy is never going to forget the that's day right. that I came and talked to him. Right. He's never going to forget it. <laughs> and, and Shalala, that's your name? I named it. I never can remember that name. But from the time she left that service that night, I didn't hear your testimony tonight. I wish I had heard it. It sounded interesting from what people's response was. But, uh, and you said to your mom, I got saved too because I was talking about Brianna. You didn't even know somebody with a, a first soprano voice was affecting people in the church. Oh my God. You didn't know this girl was having an impact on the people here and denies you the same way. Right. So I'm listening. She said, but uh, you know, Miss Rose is talking about her. Well, I got saved. Mm -hmm. Include me. I want to talk to Miss Rose. You think I have time? No, but I'll make it. So I called her. Uh, I told Minnie, I said, no, I'll call her. And I called him, oh, Miss Rose, thank you so much for calling. I'm not taking for granted. Thank you. I want to talk to you. And it ain't no, the devil going to take, beat your brains out. And none, none of that, just a nice, sweet yeah. talk. Yeah. Boy, wouldn't that be nice if that happened with every church person. Just a nice, sweet talk. Yeah. Huh. You're kidding yourself, honey. It's not happening. Most of the time, that, that's why when they answer the phone, it goes, hello. <laughs> but if it's, a, if it's good, you wouldn't have to do that. Well, I'll say, hi, how are you? Fine. <laughs> like, is there a reason you're calling? What have I done now? You didn't do nothing. Right. Do you ever do anything right that when you get a phone call, you automatically think she's calling me to tell me how proud she is of me? I don't have many people I can say that about. Right. But hey, from that time, it's what, it, it, what the effect it has on children, on the job, everything. It's going to leave it, lead behind, well, you should do how Miss Rose used to do. You should do how this, she said. You should do such and such a thing. So that's what's going on. But Leave something. Don't just die and nobody, oh, who did you say died? Oh, okay. No, somebody says, who was that? Was that, uh, who was the prophetess in the New Testament? And was it Anna? What was her name? Dorcas, Dorcas. And she, she done so many good things when she died. They were crying over her. When the apostle came and raised her up from the dead, said she was so good. Look at the coats that she made for us. Look at this that she did for us. They didn't want Dorcas to go because you don't find many Dorcases. When you find one, you wanted to live. And she was raised back because she had, she had something. And people were talking about it and crying and weeping over her, realizing the good that she'd done. Will we ever see that again? Sometime never again. Some people pass on our life one time. You'll never have them again. Learn from something. So I'm going to listen. I told my kids the other day, when I die, be sure you put, it's engraved on my casket. She made it happen.
When you get ready to bury me, be sure them big words are saying she made it happen. Because that's my life. I don't buy anything about, well, you can't do this. Well, nobody can do that. That's never been done before. Break the record. Don't, if nobody ever did it, why don't you be the first? There's always a first. Why don't you be the first? You better thank God every day for a pastor who hears from God that helps you to get started because it gives you hope. Right. It takes away all the other feelings with it. <laughs> Too many people don't pray. That's why they get nothing. Prayer makes a difference. And all I can say is that take this tonight. I will come back again and talk to you more about your own legacy. Probably give you a chance to write down uh, for me, and we discussed in the class, what's your legacy? She says, Ro, I don't even have one. You ought to shut up. Tell nobody, how old are you? I turned 50, and you still stupid? You didn't do nothing constructive? Nothing good? You didn't help nobody? I'm going to leave something in the world. What will you leave behind? After you travel to worlds unknown, what will you leave behind? Amen. Brother and Sister Hennessy used to sing that song in Oklahoma all the time. I love to hear him sing it. It's a message in itself. What will you leave behind? And we all going to leave something. Some of y'all are going to be like, well, there's a lot of people glad they did. Is there a reason for that? They're the most meanest, most honorous person on the planet. They didn't care about nobody. Selfish, self-centered. Their love was all about them. Spend your life loving other people, not you. And let me tell you, if you spend your life loving other people, your supply of love will come back. You won't be lacking. That's the truth. What's going to be your legacy? We're not going to have church this week until, uh, until Saturday or Sunday. Uh, I'm going to give you your chance to do your little Christmas daily. But let me tell you something. Do not take the time that we're out of church and don't pray. You better pray even more so. Because you're not going to be here getting a message or whatever. You better spend time with God. It should not make one bit of difference if you're out of church for three days, four days, or whatever. You should be just as on fire when you come back as when we left. That's a fact. Because if you don't, you're not going to make it. If, if, if the church was closed down during the pandemic, y'all know, some of y'all would be bachelor it already. I just couldn't make it. I tried, push the plate back, quit eating, and go talk to God. I don't care if I was out of church for six months to a year. God forbid I will not be. Uh, that's not going to affect my spirituality. It, it ain't just something that uh, works in a temporary basis. There's a lot in here I want to get to. But I hope that you'll say, think about this, so when we come back, we're going to talk about it. So what's your legacy? I hope I don't hear from one person say, you know, Sister Rowe, I don't have nothing. Every great patriarch in the world had a legacy. Great testimony. Their life pleased God. They stood up for what was right. And no matter what happened, they stood up for what was right. What do you want? When you, when you do come to the end, and every person will, are you going to be sitting saying, God, forgive me for all the lies I've been telling all my life? Or am I going to look up and say, I'm waiting for you to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in the little things, I'll make you faithful in greater things. I'll give you more. I'll give you more. Take this tonight and say, you know what? I'm going to take it seriously and I'm going to do something about it. I'm glad that man, he didn't let your drops fall. You know what? I know he'd find joy in every tear. That I shed, oh, see, and I'm glad the man didn't make heartache. 
Cause I know he'd give me more He'd give me more Than I could bear Oh See and I'm glad That man He just, he didn't create me So oh, Lord For one day Man He surely forsake me See you.